So for this um, for this paper, I was looking at two Icelandic family sagas. Uh, there are sort of these sprawling melodramas of Egil saga and the people of uh, Laxdale or Laxdale saga. And I'm actually not going to try to summarize them. Uh, if you haven't read them, please do. They're a lot of fun. I don't think you need it for this particular talk because I'm talking about sickness. Uh, so many characters die in the course of Egil's saga and the Laxdale saga. Most are um, from battle wounds or homicide, uh, some from old age or other natural causes. Characters may also take to their beds for various reasons, including grief. But in some instances, the narrator specifically reports that a character is sick. And uh, my theory behind this paper was that such mentions warrant special attention because as uh, some commentators have noted, illness and healing are not presented as central themes of medieval Scandinavians' mythical understanding of the world. Indeed, in illness in these two sagas, where mentioned at all, serves one of three main narrative functions. First seems to be sort of a simple housekeeping, that is the death moves characters off stage or furthers the plot by setting up inheritance disputes or the like, and illness is a very efficient way of justifying a death without special groundwork or explanation. Oh, sorry. Um, okay, so the second, func fun the second function is that an illness foreseen by the sufferer to be a fatal one gives him one last chance to influence the future. And the third function is that of a temporary disability that reveals something about the sufferer's mental or emotional state or other qualities that would have remained hidden. So we'll first look at the housekeeping function. So sometimes the narrator cursorily reports a character's death by illness, and it's a very economical and convenient way of removing a character who's denied death in battle. So Egil Saga and Laxdela Saga dispose of more than a dozen characters summarily in this manner, usually within a single sentence. Unsurprisingly, some of these characters are quite old when they sicken and die. Uh, both Egil and his son Thorstein are en old by the end of Egil's saga, and their adventures have been fully chronicled. Uh, in Laxdela saga, Geller uh, reaches an advanced age and makes a pilgrimage before contracting a lengthy illness and dying. And Thord may also be elderly since he dies the sem summer after his foster son takes over his farm. But the summarily described sickness is not necessarily associated with old age or a pre-existing with weakness or disability. Indeed, in Laxdela saga, uh, Dala Cole sickens and dies shortly after his wife's grandmother dies of old age. His widow Thor Thorgerd is still young enough to remarry and bear a son. Her new husband takes ill and dies during their son's childhood, and only a few years later, the th twice-widowed Thorgerd uh, dies as well. So three characters in this generation die of illness at a relatively young age. Nor do elderly persons naturally always die of illness. For example, the narrator of Laxdela Saga tells us Gudrun lived to a great age and is said to have lost her sight, but there's no indication that any illness caused her death. So from this, I infer that mentioning death by sickness is a choice even when the decedent is quite old. So in, in addition to this straightforward housekeeping function, there's perhaps a secondary effect of this uh, caused by mentioning briefly that multiple characters have died of sickness. It helps set off unusually strong and powerful characters such as Un in Laxdela Saga and Skal Grimm in Egil Saga who do not succumb to sickness. So in the second distinctive type, we have the character who foresees his own death from illness and takes the opportunity to direct events posthumously, beyond merely designating a successor or making burial arrangements. So only three characters in Egil Saga and Laxdela Saga undertake to shape the future in this way. Each of them, strikingly, pairs his recognition that his present illness will be fatal with an observation about how rarely he has suffered any sickness before. So by the far the most benign of these three, is Kveldolf in Egil's saga, who seeks to fulfill his vision of a successful settlement in Iceland. Uh, and Kveldolf is uh, Egil's grandfather, so that's how he connects in. After a sea battle en route to Iceland, as they moved further out to sea, Kveldolf succumbed to an illness. When it had brought him close to death, he called his men and told them he thought he would probably soon be parting the ways with him. I have not been prone to illness, he said, but if it happens, as I think it probably will, that I die, Make a coffin for me and put me overboard. Things will not turn out as I imagined if I do not reach Iceland and settle there. Tell my son Grimm that if he reaches Iceland and, unlikely as it seems, I am there already, to make himself a home as close as possible to the place where I have come ashore. So the crew comply with this instruction and they cast his corpse overboard in a coffin. On landing, they find the bay where the coffin is washed ashore. And his son Skallagrim, uh, Egil's father, lands further north, but when he meets Kveldolf's crew, 
he concurs that the bay and the burial site are not far from a good site to build a farm and establishes his home there. So no one questions Feldolf's instructions. The crew and the son alike all recognize his foresight. There's no hint of what might have happened had Feldolf's body not preceded them to Iceland or had they set up settlements elsewhere, but readers are likely to conclude it was wise for the settlers to follow his directions. Now, Lakstela saga actually provides almost the inverse scenario. We have Killer Hrop, who, as the name suggests, is not a very nice guy. Uh, <laughs> he lives across from hot school Dala Kolsan, and he's a belligerent and stubborn bully. Unfortunately, Hrop's nature remains unchecked. His malevolent nature remains unchecked even as his body weakens. He instructs his wife, Victus, I'm not one to catch every passing disease, and this illness will likely send us our separate ways. When I'm dead, I want to be buried in the kitchen doorway. Have me placed in the ground upright, so I'll be able to keep a watchful eye over my home. He died soon afterwards. Everything was done just as he had instructed, for she dared not go against his wishes. So there, are, as you've noticed, there are two particularly strong echoes between this episode and Kveldolf's. First, Krop claims the house is my home and proposes to keep a watchful eye on it after his death, much as Kveldolf plans to reach Iceland and settle there posthumously and advises his son to build a home close to where I have come ashore. Uh, so both cases, they envision a continuing agency after death. And second, both Hrop's and Kveldolf's deathbed wishes provoke unquestioning obedience. Uh, Kveldolf's followers and his son Skallagrim, of course, obey in hopes of ensuring the most favorable conditions for their settlement, whereas the widowed Vigdis, by contrast, complies out of fear, even though she knows Hrop's intentions are entirely malevolent. Now, unfortunately, as you may guess, Hrop's posthumous malice is effective. If anything, the narrator tells us, he was much worse dead, for he haunted the area relentlessly. His revenant, or draugr, killed most of his servants and caused no end of dis difficulty to his neighbors. So when the farmers call on Hoskold for help, he disinters Hrop, moves him somewhere far away from sheep and men alike. The narrator notes laconically, Hrop's haunting decreased considerably after this. But note, it decreases considerably, but does not end. Hoskold's actions have been only partially effective. Uh, Hrap's son is actually driven mad when he returns to live there, and soon the place is deserted. After Huskold's son Olaf purchases the lands, he eventually faces the Draugr himself and takes the additional necessary steps omitted by his father to burn Hrap's body and scatter the ashes at sea. The narrator notes, no one else was harmed by Hrap's haunting after that. So the most ambiguous of the three foresighted sufferers is Huskold, the man we've just talked about, who took the ineffective steps against the Draugr. Haskold fell ill in his old age and sent for his sons and other kinsmen. When they arrived, Haskold spoke to the brothers, Bard and uh, Thorlake. An affliction has settled over me, although I've seldom been ill, and I expect <laughs> this illness will put an end to me. Both of you know how things stand. As my legitimate sons, you inherit all my property. I have a third son who is illegitimate, and I ask you brothers to allow Olaf to be recognized so that each of you will inherit a third of my property. So notably, compared with the two previous foresighted uh, sufferers who die, uh, Haskold frames this as a request rather than an instruction as Kveldolf and Hrap do. Bard acquiesces, but his son Thorlake balks, complaining that you, father, have given Olaf many things and for some time now discriminated greatly between us brothers. I won't voluntarily give up my birthright. So Haskold instead gets their consent to a seemingly lesser deathbed gift. He tells them, you can't wish to deprive me of my legal right to give my son 12 ounces for his inheritance, if only in recognition of Olaf's high birth on his mother's side. And here, uh, Olaf is actually Huskold's bastard son by Melkorka, a slave who just happens to be an Irish princess who was kidnapped into slavery. So as soon as Thorlake agrees to this seemingly lesser deathbed gift, Huskold then took his gifts from King Hakon, a gold arm ring which weighed a mark and a sword which was worth half a mark of gold, and gave them to his son Olaf, wishing him all his own good fortune and that of his kinsmen. Olaf said he would take a chance on Thorlake's reaction and accepted the gifts. Thorlake was very angry and felt that Huskold had tricked him. Olaf does not actually deny this trickery, but vows to keep his 12 ounces of status-conferring royal treasure and weapon as you consented to the gift in the presence of witnesses. So Haskold's attempt to shape the future by further elevating his bastard, Olaf, is initially thwarted by Thorlake's resistance, but he cunningly persists. Thorlake has doubtless assumed the 12 ounces will be ordinary coins rather than kingly gifts given by King Hakon, but this perfectly reasonable assumption has been thwarted. 
Now, Hochschild's actions, unlike those of Kvaldov and Hrapp, are initially ambiguous. It's not clear if they will work for good or for ill. Ultimately, I think the saga suggests his purpose is a benef 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 beneficial one. Uh, Olaf's merit, already recently established by his successful expulsion of Hrapp's Draugr, is quickly confirmed in his, in his assuming the leadership of the three brothers, as well as in his great generosity for their father's memorial feast. Further, he diplomatically pursues reconciliation with Thorlake, acknowledging, I know you resented my accepting the gifts from our father on his deathbed, and if you still feel yourself hard done by, I would like to make it up to you by fostering your son, Bali, as he who raises the child of another is always considered the lesser of the two. This fostered relationship later slows the cycle of revenge for uh, Olaf's uh, son, Kjartan, as Olaf forbids personal vengeance on Boli, his foster son, during his own lifetime. So the third type of illness, you'll recall, is, is the non-fatal sickness and a recovery. And this kind of illness uh, proves merely transitory rather than fatal. And so it, what I noticed was that it serves a sort of character development or thematic purpose. I actually found four examples, two in each saga, but I'm going to discuss three of them. Uh, the illness and recovery of Egil, Malkorka's old nurse, and Bersi the dueler. So the first theme in, illuminated by sickness and recovery is jealousy. So in Egil's saga, we have the brothers Thorolf and Egil. One is handsome and charming, the other ugly and sullen, and they grow up with their father's foster daughter, Asgard. Egil accompanies Thorolf as he goes to stay with Asgard's uncle, and, asks, and Thorolf asks for Asgard's hand. With her uncle's support, her father consents, and the wedding will be a large, important event in the autumn. But, the narrator tells us, just before the date when Thorolf was supposed to leave home, when his party had already arrived to accompany him, Egil fell ill and was unable to join them. So after the party of worthy men depart for the wedding feast, their host's steward, Olvir, sets out to collect past due rents. Now the narrator tells us, by this time, Egil was recovering from his illness and was back on his feet. Feeling bored there after everyone had left, he approached Olvir and said he wanted to go with him. So you'll notice the narrator describes this illness with sort of a straight face, as if it were perfectly genuine. It left Egil unable to join the wedding party, and he needed to recover from it to get back on his feet. Still, the sickness is of a suspiciously short duration and rather exquisite timing. And when Egil recovers, he addresses his boredom by going with their host's steward to collect past due rents, rather than joining his brother's wedding feast. So there's some subtle hints beforehand, both in an unexplained tension between the brothers during their uh, journey to visit Asgard's un uncle, and in the narrator's comment that their host was pleased that the marriage had been arranged, thus remaining conspicuously silent about Egil's feelings about it. Now only later does the final piece of the puzzle clearly emerge. On questioning from his best friend, Egil explains that the source of his ongoing melancholy following his brother Thorolf's death is actually his love for Thorolf's widow, Asgard. In retrospect, it appeals that, appears that Egil's sickness was caused by jealousy. It was possibly even a sham, although this is never stated directly. The narrator's approach to this episode is rather coy when contrasted with other passages where Egil is distraught. For example, Egil is presented as very me melancholy rather than ill when the widowed Asgard initially kind of turns down his offer to provide for her by playing the matter down. Uh, likewise, when Egil takes to his bed on the loss of a son, it's because he does not want to live with such great sorrow. There's no suggestion that he's sick. Ultimately, it may be unnecessary to determine whether the illness was entirely a sham, an excuse to absent himself from his brother's wedding, or whether it was a genuine, although short-lived, physical manifestation of Egil's je jealousy concerning Thorolf and Asgard. Either way, the illness here works to create a mystery by concealing Egil's true condition while providing subtle clues that readers will piece together in time. Uh, so the second theme illuminated by non-fatal sickness and recovery is that of worry, I guess. Uh, so in Loxdale's saga, our friend Olaf, and this is again the fav favored bastard son by the enslaved Irish princess, uh, he goes to Ireland and confirms his mother Melkorka's royal lineage. He accompanies his maternal grandfather to Dublin. Inevitably, the news that the king was accompanied by his grandson, the son of his daughter who had been taken prisoner at the age of 15 years, caused great stir. No one was more affected by the news than Melkorka's nurse. Despite being bedridden with old age and illness, she rose and went, without the aid of her stick, to meet Olaf. Olaf received her with open arms, set her upon his lap, and told her that her former charge was living in comfort in Iceland. 
Tears of joy came to her eyes on re recognizing Melkorka's tokens, and her happiness was doubled by seeing this outstanding young son. Moreover, even though Olaf and the king do not actually remain in Dublin with her, but go off fighting, the old woman enjoyed good health for the rest of that winter. So here the nurse's recovery sounds almost miraculous, as if being bedridden and ill and unable to walk without a stick were all the result of long sadness and worry about Melkorka's fate, rather than age or any physical, uh, purely phys physical impediment. Melkorka's evident disappointment on learning that Olaf was not allowed to bring her nurse back to Iceland as he requested, further suggests a strong mutuality in love and tenderness between the nurse and her former charge. Uh, so a third theme illuminated by non-fatal sickness and recovery, I would call empathy. And this one again is Lux Della Saga. Here we have a character named Bursi the Jeweler who offers to foster Olaf's one-year-old son, Haldor. After Olaf accepts the, the offer, uh, the narrator tells us, that same summer, Bursi grew ill and was bedridden for most of the summer. It is said that one day, Haldor lay in a cradle which fell on one side and the youngster rolled out. Bursi couldn't get up to help him and spoke the following verse. Both of us lie flat on our backs, Haldor and I, helpless and frail. Old age does this to me, but youth to you. You've hope of better, but I none at all. People soon returned home and picked Haldor up the, off the floor, and Bursi got better again. Haldor grew up at Tonga and was a large and robust man. So in the second part of this verse that Bursi declaims, Bursi reveals a deep pessimism about the aging process. And while some critics do accept Bursi's self-assessment, uh, presumably, if he really were old and decrepit, he would not be managing his own farm and offering to foster other people's children, nor would Olaf have entrusted his one-year-old son to someone truly infirm. So although Bursi is correct about the inevitable and irreversible debilitation that comes with age, he really does seem to be anticipating it rather than experiencing it here. Indeed, he does recover and is apparently able to foster Haldor at Tunga until he becomes a large and robust man. So both Bursi and the narrator draw significant parallels between man and baby. Bursi stresses the negative, that a sickly man and an infant who has not yet learned to walk are both lie on, flat on our backs, helpless and frail. The narrator, by contrast, focuses on the positive, paralleling the re restoration of Haldor to his crib with Bursi's recovery from the illness. The incident thus suggests an, a perhaps unusual empathy and reflectiveness on the part of Bursi, traits not necessarily always associated with medieval Icelanders. Since Bursi does not appear again in Loxdella saga, the real significance of this episode may lie in what it reveals about the environment in which Haldor is raised. In adulthood, Olaf's son Haldor acted as leader for his brothers in most matters. Although he's drawn into revenge, he tries to limit the collateral damage. He restrains his men from looting after a revenge killing, and he reproaches a man who wipes his bloodied spear on uh, Gudrun's clothing after k helping kill her third husband. Uh, and uh, that third husband was Bolly, who you mentioned before, the son of uh, Olaf's uh, resentful, legitimate half-brother Thorlake and his foster son. Further, Haldor correctly discerns that Gudrun's friendliness and seeming indifference to Bolly's murder was because she was intent on finding out exactly who had taken part in the attack. Haldor therefore wisely agrees to pay compensation for Bolly as awarded by arbitrators in such a manner that both sides were felt to have risen in esteem as a result and he's able to intuit and forestall an unscrupulous land acquisition scheme. And I'm thinking that Haldor's discernment in those instances may well result from his fostering with the empathetic Bursi. So in conclusion, as shown, uh, sickness serves these three key functions in Egil's saga and Loxdala saga. One is essentially housekeeping, fatal illness to move characters off stage. Second fun function allows far-sighted men to shape the future from beyond the grave, and the third, a highlighted non-fatal sickness reveals something that might otherwise have remained hidden, such as an ugly man's jealous love for the woman his handsome brother has won, an old nurse's anxious love for her for former charge, and a foster father's empathetic bonding with a helpless infant who will later be drawn reluctantly into the cycles of revenge. Medieval Icelanders may have felt helpless when confronted with illnesses beyond their ability to cure or control, but in their sagas they could admire those few who stubbornly resisted and were defiant to the last, those who seized their one last chance to imprint themselves on the world they were leaving, and those who overcame, even for a short while, the inexorable siren call of disease, suffering, and death.